this is worse than anything I've ever had to deal with. And the chaos in the room, my team, they just, it's like clockwork. And you know, you think, you think they would be panicking and you think that it would bother them or whatever, but they know that they have to keep going. They know they have stuff to do that, that just has to be done. And if they don't get it done, then it goes bad again, you know? I mean, and then to sit in there and not be able to run to the help, you know, run to rescue them or whatever, it's, it's hard too. I picked the phone up and I called Chris and he didn't answer. And I waited a few minutes and I said, surely somebody has gotten a hold of him. There was so much going on. I said, somebody needs to call Chris and let him know. I mean, he needs to be, you know, notified of what's going on. So I picked the phone up again and I, I kept thinking, we're so far out, there's, you can't just drive to his house and tell him. By the time you do that, that might be seconds that minutes, you know, that he needs to be, he could have already been at the hospital by then. It took somebody, um, multiple people, um, calling my wife uh, until she finally woke up. And she came in. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget that, that look on her face uh, when she just looked at me and said, Mike's been hurt. Your mind goes from one end to the other. And you don't. And you don't know, so. Um, but anyways, by the, by the time I got up, got dressed, then of course my six-year-old was up, and she could, she's smart enough to see that there was emotion, and it and it wasn't good. Went in and saw Buddy, and uh, Buddy was sick, and um, he was hurt. He had a lot of. Um, injuries that needed to be dealt with. Um, at that particular time, I had um, no idea there were other people from the sheriff's office even there. I was kind of in my own little world and, and um, uh, kind of stepped away and I called the sheriff and told the sheriff to prepare for the worst. Uh, so I ended up at the hospital and um, I just remember, you know, I was, one of the officers said, just, just find a place to park, the, you know, the, you, they're telling us just park, you know, somewhere near the ER. And, um, they don't know me as Sheriff Kevin Tolson at the ER. They, they saw that I had a badge and gun on and, uh, it was like star treatment from the hospital security staff from CMPD, I found out later uh, they went into lockdown mode in the ER. CMPD posted two officers outside of each one of our rooms. The officers were given aliases. Our officers that were there were um, given, you know, the, just the royal treatment. Um, I cannot say enough about uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg PD um, and and how they handled that for us and with us. And just, I'm like, well, he's going to be okay, right? And Mike's like, no, I, I don't think so. And I remember just standing in the parking lot of that church beside my truck with Mike Chanel telling me that about Mike Doty. And just everything just stopped. But as soon as I opened the door to the ambulance, I knew it wasn't good. didn't stop us from doing everything we could. And then everybody wanted to go to the hospital and and we couldn't and we couldn't go to the hospital right then because we had to come back here and you know they had to verify when you got 20 plus guys on the scene and only a handful of them did shooting and they have to verify all that you know they had to make sure they look at your weapons they take your magazines they count all your bullets to be sure that all the bullets you said you have you actually have and that you know that accountability and they take pictures of you for 
evidentiary purposes, you know, uh, good and bad, but it's a little different. You know, you feel kind of like a suspect and all that. But I get in my car, and that's when you start gathering your thoughts when you're by yourself. Did I just experience that? Did that did that just happen? So I hadn't I didn't know who to call. I didn't know what to do, and I was thinking, okay. Tell the media to meet me at the corner of Parham and Campbell Road. No, that's stupid. There's too many people coming in and out of here. And I tell them, say, let's go meet me at the, the church. At the, and, and I thought, no, that's where the landing zone is. And so I, just, I stopped on the side of uh, Campbell Road, and I just said, we're going to meet back at the Moss Justice Center. So I get back here. I need to apologize to a reporter because they were already here and they knew and they wanted information right then and there. And I yelled at some reporter, poor girl out, out front. I said, you can wait. You can wait. And everybody told me to calm down. And I hate that I did it this way. I told everybody to meet me in the jury assembly room, but I didn't know all the SWAT team guys were going to be coming back in through the front door at the same time as the media. So I had to ask Mark Bollinger. I said, Mark, you know, make sure that the SWAT guys go towards the detention center where they're going to do their debrief and direct all the media away from them. It was just a dumb call. Nobody was talking. A room full of 20-something guys that laugh and joke and cut up all the time. You, half the time you can't get them to shut up, and everybody's just – Sitting around there being quiet, thinking about what happened and what they could have done or what they should have done. So there's two officers were taken to CMC Maine by helicopter and the other one by ground. And it was probably one of the hardest things I ever had to do was after what had seen and what had happened was having to get in front of television cameras and say that we've had four people shot. It's easier the first time than the second time. Um, and everybody asked me, so how, how's everybody doing around here? And I told them something along the lines of like, you know, we, we've got to muscle up and keep doing our jobs and keep moving on because it was that big of, you know, everybody had to keep doing their jobs. It's not like we could, the world had to stop. After hearing, you know, Randy was doing okay, Buddy was in surgery, Kyle was in surgery, they were expected to do okay, but the sheriff called and told me that Mike was, was not going to, probably not going to make it. When I had to start talking about people's conditions, I knew Mike was the one that was, critical and I thought I could hold it back but I had to take a breath before I could say it because if I if I didn't I would have probably cried all on national television one officer was critically wounded and his situation is very critical at this time and that's all I could tell you about his condition they began treating me there at the hospital for hypothermia. When I came in, I believe my body temperature was around 91 degrees, which is extremely low. They told me another two degrees and it would have been bad. It would have been permanent damage. <clears throat> um, I remember laying there in that bed and just not really caring about me in the hospital. I was thinking about my brothers, my guys that were shot and down and how bad Mike was, and I didn't know how bad everybody else was. So when the nurse came back in, I asked her, I said, hey, what do I gotta do to get out of here? She said, I need to see you walk for 30 minutes. Well, I'd say an hour later, um, on my right side, if your leg falls asleep, you know, you get that tingly feeling, and you can almost feel the blood going back to your leg as it starts waking back up. Well, I can remember feeling that, that blood release feeling in my right leg about an hour and a half into it. 
Um, I had several blankets on me, a warming blanket and blankets on top of that. <clears throat> she said, well, your body temperature is back up to 95, but we got to get you on up. They left me for another hour. And I began warming up and I remember feeling my left leg release. And that's the best feeling in the world to be able to have feeling back in my legs because I thought at that point I was done. Like I, I just knew I was gonna be either paralyzed or have some significant damage to my legs. They got my discharge papers ready. Um, Hunter put me, helped me to his vehicle, put me in his vehicle and uh, we went to my house and got to my house and uh, my wife was fixing to take my little girls to school because I told her to take them to school as if nothing happened. Daddy's fine, just take them to school. And I remember when I seen them, I just lost it because I just knew, I just knew in my heart that night that it was it, that that was my time, I was gone. And to see my family and be able to wrap my arms around my little girls and my wife, that's a, that's a feeling I can't describe, man. Um, I didn't even realize till I, I got to the hospital and, and walked in the hospital and Lori Kimball was there and she looked at me and she, she grabbed my hands and she looked at, flipped my hands over and she looked at them again and she said, go to the bathroom and wash your hands. And my hands were just covered in blood. And I, it was just from, you know, when I was trying to help with Kyle and putting my hand down and finding that he was, you know, actually bleeding from the leg. But I did, that stuff didn't even, I mean, I got in the car and drove all the way there. I didn't even pay any attention to that. You know, I was just, it was just so much going on at one time. By the time we got there, um, you know, you just walk in and, and it's just, you, I was focused on one thing. And that was regardless of his condition, it was, I wanted to see him. Charlotte PD, or Charlotte Medical Center PD, they literally just about wrote out the red carpet for us, you know. I think if they would have had a red carpet, they would have done it. They would have wrote it out for us. Um, they just goes to prove the brotherhood is real. Um, so I gathered those who were in the command staff who were at the hospital and they gave us uh, a little room that was actually their kind of break where they kept their purses uh, and their personal items and a computer, it was just kind of a makeshift room. And I remember we were having a meeting about things. Uh, the office is still running, things are still happening and we have the business of the office you know, has to be conducted and that's what we're kind of doing there. And I remember that one of the nurses coming in and um, knocking real lightly and kind of, she's like, I'm so sorry to bother, can I um, come in and, and and get this and that was their place uh, but they made it feel like it was our place and we were letting them use it whatever you need however long you need it um, we just invaded that floor and there was other patients there this was a neuro neuro floor uh, so there were other critically ill patients there but whoever wanted to see Mike uh, whenever they wanted to see him they made it happen so we got me up out of the bed and all my hoses and tubes and pumps and everything they had me hooked up to and, and I sat down in a chair. And it was, it took me a minute, it took me a minute to do it. And when they did it, I said, you need, I want you to take me to where Mike is. Because initially when, when people would come to see me, they wouldn't, everybody kept saying that Randy and Kyle were fine. Randy and Kyle are fine, Randy and Kyle are doing great. And I knew, and I was very, very doped up. And I knew there was something I was missing, but I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. And then I realized, oh crap, you know, what's going on with Mike? Why hasn't Mike, why aren't they talking about Mike? And I started asking people about it in the room. I knew it was bad because uh, he was right in front of me when he got shot. So I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. Um, you know, and, and those, in, that, in the woods, um, when the shooting was happening, you didn't really have time to think. You didn't have time to think about anything but what was in front of you. I told the, the nurses, I said, well, you need to take me to where Mike is. And they tried to tell me that they couldn't or they weren't. And I said, no, I'm not getting out of this chair until you take me you know, to where Mike is. 
And they left for a few minutes, and they came back, and they took me down. I remember because it was snowing that day. They took me and set me by. They rolled me down to the floor where Mike was, and they set me by a window, and it was snowing. And Chris and Mike's dad and their other brother came down and, and saw me for a minute. And then they rolled us all in to Mike's room, and we got to see him, which was, I'm glad we did. It was me and Kyle and Randy, and they had cleared everybody but the family you know, out of there and let us, let us have a moment. I broke down in that situation. Uh, I, I, I wasn't the way I wanted to see him. Um, he, he sacrificed himself for us. Uh, he won't be forgotten, that's for sure. And, and he, you knew from the very beginning, as soon as you saw him the first time, nothing, nothing was going to change. Um, so I, you, you obviously start to mentally and to a certain extent physically prepare yourself for that. It was Mike, but it wasn't Mike. Um, and I guess for me too, I didn't, I didn't want to focus on that because I didn't want to be that. I didn't want the hospital room to be what I remembered last. And the next person I saw outside was uh, Chris Doty. And um, I couldn't look at him. And uh, even though I know everything that could have been done for Mike was done for Mike, um, It was still very much a we let you down feeling. Shell shock. I, I didn't know what to do. And it took, you know, because there was nothing we could do. SLED was handling everything. So there was no work to be found. And that's one of the things is, is find work. Don't just stand around. Go find work. There was no work to be found. It wasn't our case, it wasn't our investigation. I'm just sitting in a car. They immediately locked the ER down. Nobody got in. If you're not law enforcement, you wasn't getting in the door. Um, I hated that for the, the normal citizens, you know, that were coming in, but that, that area where we were at was completely locked down to nothing but law enforcement only. My next efforts was to work with the hospital staff because I knew who the next person coming into the hospital was going to be, and that was the the shooter. And uh, so, pretty pretty directly, I asked for the two paths never to cross. There was a lot of hurting people there, and um, the one who caused harm, uh, I felt shouldn't need to see anything that he had done to us. And I remember uh, Ligon handed me a rifle to, to put with the other rifles and it was covered in blood. And then, you know, after I, I put that rifle down, I realized I had, you know, one of my brother's blood on my hands, you know, so to speak. And it was, you know, it's, it's difficult you know, whenever you have your own blood on you, but then when you have somebody else's that you know just got hurt, you know, it was another one of those things that I had to deal with. Um, I had called my my lieutenant and I and right away and I told him I said, um, I said, hey LT, um, you know, I don't know if you know, Randy was shot and Buddy was shot and Kyle Cummings was shot and they said they say my Doty got shot too. And he's like, oh, my God, you know, like he, he had no idea and everything like that. And I remember calling Diane right away, my wife. I didn't have my phones because they were in Doty's car and his, his vehicle. He had locked his car before he got in a Bearcat. And so I wasn't able to call my wife initially because I didn't have my cell phone. But I was able to grab cell phone from Yates. And uh, he allowed me to call her. And she didn't answer because she obviously she was asleep. I remember going home that morning. My wife was was still in bed, and 
I remember waking her up and telling her what happened. I, I don't ever want to have to tell my wife that one of the guys got killed, one of the guys got shot, one of the guys died. I don't ever want to do that again. Um, I went home and, and met with my wife and changed clothes and immediately drove up to the hospital and uh, where it seemed like already half the department was already there, you know. Um, and, and met with the team guys and Mike's family and they had Mike in a room and everybody taking their uh, turns to go see him. And I didn't get an opportunity to get up to the hospital until, until later that night. And when I got to the hospital, you know, it was, I wanted, I wanted to see Mike and I wanted to see Buddy. I want to see Kyle and everybody, but I, I didn't expect to see what I was going to see. So I already have a problem with <clears throat> people in hospitals and everything. It's just a, a personal thing where I don't, you know, my family members seeing them in hospitals and they're not doing well. And, and I walked by the room and I saw, I saw him in, in, his, in, in the bed and I was like, I can't go in there. But all the people were around and you just start hugging people and you hug people. Once we, once everybody got there, all of our family that came in from out of town and other friends, um, you know, people, you know, from the department, people that we grew up with. Um, I had one buddy that I hadn't seen in probably eight years who's a police officer in North Carolina. And he called me and he's like, I heard. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's not good. He's like, if you need anything, let me know. We, we spoke for another couple minutes. And about an hour and a half later, he came walking in. So anyways, through all that, and then it comes down to the time to make a decision. And again, we, we still, Obviously, we knew, um, but when we started going over options, and we, we knew that Mike was an organ donor, we once again prepared ourselves for that part of it, um, made sure that everybody had an opportunity to, to say one last goodbye, and then just, just the family uh, went downstairs. Final memory in the hospital with Mike. It was, um, there was a point in time that we knew on, a, on that Wednesday, the 17th, that Mike was intubated um, and, and um, actually was off the ventilator, uh, came off the ventilator, and um, we knew that the decision was made to, that Mike was going to be taken off all life support, that they would most likely pass, and they're going to harvest. Some, some organs. Mike was an organ donor. and They shut that entire uh, floor's rooms in the, in the ICU. They allowed us to line the halls. Uh, and they um, rolled Mike in his bed from his room to the elevator to the OR where, we, where all of us pretty much knew that was going to be our last moment seeing Mike alive. And I remember how emotional that was for everybody. And I, I remember the staff who was behind Mike's bed wheeling it. They were uh, as emotional as we were. And so that spoke to me that they, how much they saw that we cared and, and the pain that we were enduring. So we went in, um, went into um, an operating room downstairs. Um, and just held his hand, uh, and then he passed. Uh, and then 
you come out and it's you were devastated that that it, it that he had finally passed but at the same time there was a little bit of relief that you knew that he wasn't suffering anymore before that night if you if you told me that that would happen I'd, I'd call you a liar you know I said that that was just impossible you know but it isn't and when you know a bad guy has a say and sets up an ambush point there really isn't a whole lot you can do. And Wayne Matthews and, and the other pilots come in, the other dog hounds from Columbia come in. And I looked at Wayne, I said, you saved a lot of lives that night because you let them know where the suspect's at compared to not knowing where the suspect's at. If, if no one would have known where that suspect's at and Wayne and them hadn't been able to tell them in that helicopter, it'd have been more body bags here because he was prepared for it. I don't know, it's just, it's surreal, you know, it's just kind of tough thinking back how quick things happen, um, how many things you do remember, you know, about what happened. Um, people that, you know, I remember seeing, you know, distinctly seeing people's faces um, and the way things, you know, the way things ended up, but... Um, it had been tough, <laughs> tough to deal with it, period. But it really makes you, when something like that happens, it really makes you appreciate your family even more. Lieutenant Blevins calling me up on the phone and um, saying that, that the captain wanted me to, um, to go home and, and get ready, um, shave and everything like that and, and put on my Class A uniform. He wanted me to come back that night and um, help out with, with Mike's with what Mike's remains. I went back to the hospital and um, met my partner um, that I work with with every day. And he had the first portion of um, standing guard of Mike. And um, I remember getting there and, and, and you know thinking to myself, after all this is done and everything like that. Um, I wonder if that man, you know, if he, if he thought this through and thought for a minute that, you know, Mike would be behind this plain wooden door with a, with a chair very much like this, where I guess they leave there um, if, if there's the remains of someone inside that room that, that needs to be guarded by law enforcement. Um, unfortunately, that, that night and, and was, was, I was tasked with that job, and in hindsight, I probably should have asked if someone else could do it after everything that transpired the last few days. There was a lot of really bad things that happened out there that night, but there was also some good things. There was also some, some things that worked out the way they were supposed to, and, uh, and us doing the right thing in our training and, and, and you know, experience coming through. But it was, it was definitely, if you told me a week before then that, we would, you know, have a call and have four officers shot, and we would lose a guy, and you know, the, all that crazy stuff. I would have, I would have never thought that would happen here in a million years. You know, it's just, it's one of those things. You know, I've, I've been in shootings before, and been in some bad spots before, uh, and just, you know, in some shootings, and you know, just never, I've never been in anything like that. It was just, it was really hard. Um, I grappled, grappled with it for a long time, so I don't feel like I got the justice the family deserved, Mike's family deserved. Um, but I watched the way the solicitors handled the case, their family, their strength. Um, then I came to grips with, with the, you know, the sheriff and everybody around here was just so great. The community, everybody was just so, so supportive. It just, I knew we have a great community. It's, it just, it was just so reaffirming to see how much support we had from them.
<clears throat> the toughest thing was was uh, seeing your 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 friends and coworkers, uh, team members, whatever you want to call them, employees, um, hurting, and you can't really do a whole lot other than try to be as, as, as strong as possible. And I hope I did that. I know I, know I just look at this just like now. <clears throat> I know I have my moments, but um, it's tough seeing all that pain. I've seen a lot of things in 26 years, you know, a lot of crime scenes. I worked crime scene for <clears throat> almost nine. I could always deal with the gore and the uh, blood and whatever it is. <clears throat> but the first time that I would hear a mama wail out in pain, that's where it really hit me. So I'm a, I guess I'm a little bit of a pain absorber. And so that, that was, of all of losing Mike <clears throat> and, and uh, knowing the friend that he was and the type of person he was, uh, that was probably the hardest hardest um, aspect of, the, of this. Glad to be here. I just had another surgery. My leg was not healing proper. Um, they wanted me to have another surgery because it's been like nine months and uh, I was able to put a lot of pressure on it. They started letting me put pressure on it and then everything to try to mend it, to get it to start healing. It wasn't healing uh, right. They said, when you get my age, you get old and everything, and, and you don't put off the calcium that you normally do uh, at an earlier age. Earlier, uh, a younger person would have recovered quicker from this. But mine was not a normal break. Mine was shattered where the bullets, where the two bullets went into me. Um, they went back the last week for surgery. Uh, they had a screw in my knee that backed out and it was just, the skin was just holding it in. They took that screw out, they put, took bone marrow off my pelvis and bone draft at, around the break, and they put a plate, wrapped a plate around my, the, they says within five or six weeks I'll be walking, three months I should be healed. I've, I've had a great attitude about it. Uh, let me tell you something, I'm, I'm 57 years old. I ain't too old, I can't cry. Uh, I've cried about it, I've laughed about it, and everything. And just like certain people that, you know, there was mentors to me and, and the ones I was around my whole career, uh, they could come up to me and look at me and I was just like, you know, you lose it, you know, for a second or two, and you, hey, I'm human. I got pulse, I got my buzz, you know, red too. January 16th, I couldn't have told you the name of a single officer of Charlotte PD. Um, they couldn't have told you my name. Just wouldn't have known each other. But um, they treated me like I was family. Um, they treated my family like they're part of the family. Um, if we needed anything, those guys were more than willing to do anything. Um, it was overwhelming. I never would have expected it. The community, goodness gracious. Um, I don't. I don't think we bought toilet paper for six months. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but they created like a meal schedule for us. Um, so every night, um, somebody different was bringing dinner to my family. Um, my wife and my three kids, um, they were bringing dinner every night. Um, we had so much food. Um, we had, oh man, we could have fed a small army. And that's how much food we had. There's nothing that we could have asked for because we had it. Um, I mean, we had everything we could have asked for and some. A couple days later, I got to go home. I spent uh, 10 days total in the hospital, had five surgeries, um, got out, started with uh, home physical therapy, uh, worked to, until I was able to kind of walk around on a walker. You know, I, I started with, you know, just getting up to go to the bathroom would completely exhaust me. And now I'm, you know, working out and doing stuff. I've um, the support that we've received from the community through this thing has just been amazing. It's, you know, with all the the fundraisers and the stuff that's gone on, it's just been it's just been incredible. Land in the hospital room, I says, Sheriff, I've been here 34 years. I says, I, bl I sweat it, blood, sweat, and tears for this division. The only thing I ask you to do is back me. 
until I get healed? Because I'm coming back. Uh, it's no ifs and buts about it. People say, well, you should, you know, you should call it and you, you, know, should, you should rethink it. No. When I'm ready to quit, it's going to be on my terms, not on his terms. He ain't making me retire. I'm retiring on my terms. You know, looking back on it, it means so much. Um, and it kind of makes days like, you know, January 16th. Not gonna say, I don't want to say worth it because it's not worth it. It's not worth losing an officer, but it makes you feel appreciated for what you go through, I guess. The chaos and tragedy and just, you know, people's lives. When the, when the first shot broke that morning, people's lives were changed forever. And uh, our, our, our first nighttime training after that event when the guys started shooting and you could smell the gunpowder and you know it takes you right back and uh, we uh, uh, you know watching the news and seeing what other people go through in the law enforcement community I know I, I've always known what they're up against but I kind of also just wore the T-shirt and kind of cheered on the police officers. Um, now, I, hopefully, I've earned my, my T-shirt and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the respect and, and the gratitude for what these guys and gals do literally every day. And the only other thought I had was is that for, for years and years and years, I've been running with the canine team running through the woods as fast as we could sometimes. Um, lights shining everywhere and usually not armed very well. Usually with just a handgun and a flashlight. Um, for the most part, most of us don't, don't even have a gun light equipped on our gun. Um, talking on the radio, talking to each other, dogs barking. Uh, making noise, breaking trees as we run through the neighbor, um, through the woods after people, that this could have happened many, many times. I, I, I always was always in the back of my mind that it that it, it was going to happen one day, but um, it, I still wasn't ready for it when it happened. And I thought I was gone that night, and from the phone to me not getting ready quick enough to me not driving fast to Randy calling for a helicopter. Just everything all together just created this picture to where it was an unwinnable situation that no matter what we did, we couldn't have come out on top for that situation. But I realized something that it's about the best way I could say it is, you know, I'm a killer, but I'm not a murderer. And I didn't want to be like him. He took Mike's life for no reason. He could have easily have given up at any point. We would have treated him like any other time. He would have been treated with, you know, respect. Well, shit that goes with it, but you know, we do that, that we do believe in that. And if we have to take a human life, it's not easy. It's not it's not fun. It's not what you get in this job for. It's not we're not out here to dish the dish what we think is justice. That, that, that's not who we are. We just, we're collectors of the facts. We have to do that hard, bad things sometimes. Um, but we have to be justified in all that we do. And I feel like we were justified in everything we did. Um, you know, I just, it, it, I, I grappled with that. I grappled with that for quite a bit. And then I realized that I would have been no better than him. You know, at one time he reached for his gun. You know, at one time he was reaching, it was like he was going for a gun. All he was trying to do was uh, tell us that he had something else on him. You know, we gave him far more as we would give anybody. You know, the respect they deserve as a human being. But he surely didn't give that to any of us. I think justice was certainly served. You know, he got a life sentence out of it, and. 
I see, I guess the strength of uh, Mike's family is inspirational for everybody. I don't think I could have been that forgiven if you'd taken my son. Matter of fact, I know I couldn't. So, I mean, he's definitely an inspiration for his father, his brother, his mother, his teammates. You know, we miss him and missing one thing I told the sheriff when we were in the when we were in the hospital is that um, some of us were injured you know me and Kyle and Randy and Mike you know we lost Mike but were injured and everybody was hurt by this thing so it was uh, kind of good that you know we're a year out and we've got everything settled and, and done there were a lot of us that, you know, I got three kids. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't say what it have been like. And I mean, I can't what if it, and I don't what if it. Um, because if you do, it only drives you crazy. Um, but the sacrifice he gave, like, that night, I'll never be able to repay him for. I'll never be able to repay him. Randy, I'll never be able to repay Kyle or Buddy, you know, if, if, if Kyle hadn't done what he did that night, you know, we may still have a lot more officers down than what Buddy did, uh, Mike. Um, it's tough, all of it, you know, and uh, you just have to try and make your peace with it. I don't mean you like it, but everybody has to make their peace with it. And um, I miss him. But I think it is important too, to know that everything Dodie did up until the time that, that he gave his life away for the community is what you would ask of somebody to do. He did his job as best as he could and did what he was trained to do. He was an EMT, so he was coordinating with the ambulances and with dispatch as far as getting those medical resources in for Sergeant Clinton. We raked the roads up and down through that neighborhood trying to find where Sergeant Clinton was because Doty was so focused on, I want to get to Sergeant Clinton so that, that I can help him however that I can. And then once Sergeant Clinton was picked up by Lieutenant Clevenger, he shifted his focus to making sure that those medical resources that were coming in the area, that you know they were getting somewhere to where maybe we could get Sergeant Clinton into an ambulance. He wasn't just somebody that you could just go up to and be his friend. You had to work to be that friend. But once you got in there, but I know whenever he would call into dispatch, he would, he's, he always had that little voice that you, that I recognized him and he never had to tell me who he was and even on the radio. I know his voice and I can still hear his voice. You know, sometimes when Chris calls, I'm like, oh my God, he, he's sounding more and more like Mike every day. And I know a lot of people have said he looks more and more like Mike every day because he's changed his hair and stuff. Yeah. And uh, so, but I, I don't know if it's because I'm forgetting uh, what he sounds like or I don't know. <laughs> but. Mike's passion to help others was evident um, from the first time you met. If you ever met Mike, you know that's one of the things about him. That he was very passionate about what he did um, with Keystone and helping, you know, People get off drugs and, you know, trying to stop underage drinking and things of that nature. His passion to help community members was uh, remarkable. But his compassion and willingness to help us was even more remarkable. Um, you, if you had a, if you were a friend of Mike Doty, you certainly had a friend. Um, he'd give you the shirt off his back. If you didn't know Mike, you might not understand 
how he displayed his caring. Uh, I mean, he 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 had a scowl on his face most of the time, and he he, you know, if somebody performed less than what he expected in any area, he he didn't bother telling them or you or anybody that was standing around that it, it could have been done better, you know. If, if you did something and he thought it was the wrong thing to do, he, he, he voiced his opinion. Um, but but he, he also knew stuff, and I know this sounds, this sounds kind of corny, but, you know, he, um, he knew when you needed a hug. Like he, and, and he used to come up to me in the parking lot of District 3 or, or in, in our office, and, and he's, come on, come on, Chris, you need a hug and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm kind of like a standoffish guy. Like I said, I'm up from north, and we're not, I mean, you know, I, we're, I guess my upbringing was, was not very emotional or didn't show much affection um, towards things. But I remember Mike always, always, um, you know, wanting to offer a hug for somebody. And they won't be forgotten, that's for sure. I'm not the person that I don't go out here and I don't put a bunch of stuff on Facebook. I, I watch everybody else's stuff they put on Facebook and stuff. Uh, I don't put a bunch of stuff on Facebook uh, to everything. Uh, but no, he won't be forgotten in my heart, you know, and that's all that matters that, you know, he could be forgotten by a thousand people, but he'll never be forgotten for me. He was truly, Mike was truly a genuinely, you know, he's a genuine person. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people say, you know, and I do this myself, I'll help you with anything I can. You know, if you need something, especially if something's going on. Um, but Mike was that guy. He cared about everybody. It didn't matter one way or the other. It didn't matter if they were, you know, rate, what the race was, male, female, kids, whatever. He cared about everybody. I don't know. He was just genuine. And he... He truly is missed every day. He'd look at a menu and he'd be like, "See, you got a chef salad. Well, what all comes on the chef salad?" Mike, it's the same things on every chef salad. They make them the same way everywhere. Well, what kind of lettuce do you use? Mike, they use green lettuce. I don't, I don't know what to tell you, brother. And then he'd order a Philly cheesesteak. He'd ask five questions about a salad, and then he'd order a Philly cheesesteak. And, and he'd do it with a little smirk. And he'd, he'd look at a waitress and he'd go, well, what do you recommend? Well, I'd, I'd have the French dip. It's really good. Oh, okay, well, I'll have the Caesar salad then. And he'd just have that little smirk at the end whenever he'd do it. And, 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 and if he didn't smile, he'd be like, golly, what a jerk. But, you know, nine times out of ten, the waitresses would laugh too at him. And... It was, that that was the Mike I had fun with. I worked, I worked patrol with him. I worked narcotics with him. And there's no better person to be around. I'm not as fortunate to know, have known Mike as long as everybody else. I'm not as fortunate. I've only, I only knew him about six years but I knew him long enough to know that he cared about everybody. Even though he would look at you and you would think that, God, he must hate me. What did I do to make him mad? No, that was just Mike. I know several times on some of the meth lab calls we would uh, start picking at each other and, and uh, kind of bantering back and forth at each other. <laughs> I think that's probably what I probably what I missed the most. <clears throat> Always had the best interest of his team, no matter what team that was, whether it was on the street, whether it was uh, drug enforcement or whether it was SWAT or whatever. 
I think he looked at everybody as family and not as co-workers. Dodie's like all of us, right? Dodie was not a saint. You know, he had his, his bad times just like everybody else had their bad times. And, but Dodie always did what you ask him to do and would go above and beyond that. And I, I don't think that you can question his dedication to the job and to the community. I helped him out a couple times with the Explorers and just to see his dedication to making sure that, you know, kids had a positive place to spend their time and able to do things, you know, that is positive for the community and also benefit themselves. He was really focused on helping the young people, right? Getting these people before they made bad decisions that led them to drug use or to a place in their life where they may wind up in prison or, you know, not even making it that far and maybe, you know, losing their life to drug addiction or to the circumstances of the street. Funny story about Mike. Um, we're at the, we're at SWAT training one day and um, we're getting, <clears throat> targets ready to shoot and uh, so we're stapling the paper targets to the cardboard backers and uh, we have a slight breeze blowing so it's uh, blowing the paper targets up and so without even talking Mike just reaches down grabs my hand and puts it down on the paper target to hold it down so he can staple it and you know we just went on about fixing targets and didn't even say anything about it it's just so funny how it happened um, but knowing Mike um, <laughs> that's, you know, how Mike was, he's just an awesome human being. Mike Doty is the, one of the finest warriors America has to offer, um, without a doubt. Mike's a true hero, and uh, he'll never be forgotten, ever. He was an angry individual at times, but uh, he he had a big heart. He um, he cared a lot. He cared a lot about his job. He cared a lot about people. Um, and there was even things that you know afterwards you find out about people that you didn't realize all the things that they had done. And um, you know he he uh, he gave. He was a giver, and he gave that night was when we had Mike's funeral and I was just down in Florence and their suspect lived also the same way that ours did. And a lot of our guys struggled, me included, struggled with the fact that he took Mike's life and he lived and that we weren't able to take his life. And I know there's a plan and I know it worked out just exactly the way that it was supposed to work out. But a lot, a lot of guys struggled with that hard. And we were when we were in the funeral, Heath Clevenger was pushing, was pushing me in a wheelchair. You know, because he's big enough to push me around. And um, we uh, we were sitting there and we're, the funeral's going on. Mike's older brother, I can never remember his name, but Mike's older brother who's in the Air Force, gets up and he starts talking. And he said that part about, um, not being overcome by evil, but overcoming evil with good. And that really, that really stuck with that was a moment where we were like, okay, this is, this is what, this is why we weren't, you know, this is why we didn't, weren't able to kill him. This is why, you know, and when we went to, uh, when I went to Florence, I was involved with their debrief. The debrief that, that the sheriff had when I was able, I wasn't able to go because I was still in the hospital. And I told the guys in Florence that story and, and urged them to not be overcome with evil because of, a lot of them are struggling with the fact they couldn't. They couldn't end that guy also. And that was one of the biggest, it, it, it's the similarities to Florence are so amazing and 
it made me feel really good that we were able to go down there and maybe help those guys through a little bit. You know, I, I had the pleasure of working uh, the alcohol enforcement team with Mike when I was with the solicitor's office. <coughs> and we would make several charges that night, and of course, um, there's a fair amount of mundane paperwork that needs to be taken care of. And, and we'd, we'd uh, everybody's wanting to kind of get it on and get home because they've worked a full day and this is kind of off duty stuff and extra money and all that. And we, so we get back to the office, and this happened on more than one occasion. Nobody wants to do the report. That's the, you know, that's the, the meat of what has to be done last. And we'd walk in the office, and Mike would say, "Give me your information. Give me the, who you charge? Give me this. Give me. I got the report. I got the report. Oh, Mike, I got it. Oh, I get. I get it. I got it. I mean, wouldn't. I mean, you knew you weren't going to argue with him. He just had his mind made up. He was going to do it, and that seems very trivial. But equate that to um, the scene that night. I remember Mike's urgency on the radio. He was looking for McCall. Um, and he was at one point in time asked about Randy's condition. Um, Mike Doty was the only officer of those seven who went after McCall that wasn't married or had a biological kid. And if it were all to happen over again and we rewound time and Mike knew what was going to happen, Mike would volunteer to be the one. No doubt in my mind. That's the kind of Mike man was. But I guess as these first come up, it it makes me as we draw closer to the holidays, it makes me think about it. And it's it again, it's just his heart, the way he he loved. Obviously, people know that yeah, you know, Mike wasn't always the most pleasant, but that that was the outside. The inside was just the love that he had, and it was didn't matter who you are. Or who you were, if he was if he was your friend or a family member, it was just his his pure love. And sometimes it it was raw pure love, and sometimes it was he was mad. But it always drew back to that love. And so the biggest thing that I would say is is his his passion and his love for his friends and family. That, that is what will be missed t to me more than anything else.